On the 17th of January, we published the first estimates on the size of the 2019 novel coronavirus epidemic. These estimates suggested that the virus had infected substantially more people than had been confirmed at the time. On the 30th of January, the World Health Organization declared the novel coronavirus a public health emergency of international concern. Today, I will speak with three experts at the MRC Center for Global Infectious Disease Analysis and the Abdul Latif Jamil Institute for Disease and Emergency Analytics, in short, JIDEA. I will now speak with Professor Neil Ferguson, director of JIDEA, to give us an update on the current status of the novel coronavirus outbreak. I mean, the epidemic is continuing to spread internationally with more um, cases outside China being reported every day. Um, some notable ones like the cruise ship in Japan giving also indication on how rapidly the disease spreads from person to person. In China, at the epicenter, Wuhan City, case numbers appear to be plateauing. It's too early to be sure. It's in line with predictions that the epidemic would peak in the next week or two at least. It's very difficult to know what's really going on in China because they're using a case definition such that they only test people with really travel history to Wuhan and Hubei province. And so there are anecdotal reports of large surges in pneumonia cases in multiple cities across China. Those are not currently reflected in official case numbers. I mean, we would expect the epidemic to be progressing in China um, from, from current data. And what can we say about the severity of the coronavirus? I mean, the team here has been working hard for the last two to three weeks on trying to say something about really the range of clinical symptoms, and particularly the thing we're most concerned about, you know, what proportion of people infected with this virus might die. It's a challenging question to answer because depending where you look, surveillance systems, hospitals, medical systems are picking up different ranges of severity. We think in China, really, it's only the most severe cases who are being tested for the virus. And so based on a variety of data sources, official case reports and then early case data from China, we estimate something of the order of 18% of cases in certainly um, the epicenter Wuhan um, may die. That's not to say 18% of everybody infected with the virus in Wuhan will die. We think separately that perhaps only 5% of cases are actually being tested in that city. So we're seeing a kind of severe tip of the iceberg and hence we get relatively high estimates of the proportion of those cases who might die. Another group we can look at is the cases seen in travellers and there we also have very little data to go on. We've only had two deaths and well over 290 travellers diagnosed so far. That brings us to another challenge with doing this sort of calculation, that there's a long delay from when somebody is diagnosed typically with this virus and where most people, if they are going to die, will die. Something like three weeks, we think, from, from data in China. And that's consistent with what we know from SARS some 20 years ago for these sort of viruses. And so when we look at deaths today, we might superficially have been reassured somewhat that we've only had seen two deaths, 290 exported cases, but really the deaths we see so far need to be compared with where case numbers were, for instance, about two weeks ago. And of course, with an exponentially growing epidemic, that's many fewer. And so our estimates in that traveller population, I mean, the, there's a lot of uncertainty, but the central estimates are between 2 and 5% roughly. Uh, even that, though, doesn't really tell us the number we want to know, which is in a large epidemic, what proportion of people infected might die. And the reason it doesn't is that there's been a lot of focus clearly on travellers coming into countries with apparent signs of illness. The surveillance won't have picked everybody up. Some people will have had may, may very mild disease. Some people infected may not show any symptoms at all. And so to get to that last number, we need an estimate of really what's the true number of people infected. The only data we have on that is actually from the flights which where a number of countries repatriated their citizens back to, uh, for instance, Germany and Japan. And they swabbed everybody on those planes, took a nasal swab and tested it for virus. And so that gives us a measure of what's called infection prevalence, what proportion of people are infected, irrespective of whether they have symptoms or not. And we can go back and say, well, if those people were representative of everybody in, in Wuhan, you know, what does that imply about the size of the epidemic there? And what that tells us, that calculation, is really that the epidemic is, is overall um, 
three times larger than it would be even allowing for the travellers. So basically, countries around the world are probably detecting only one in three, one in four of the infected people coming in to those countries. That seems like bad news in one respect. It's good news in the sense that it gives us another way of you know, putting the reported deaths in, the tra in cases in travellers into perspective. And we have to divide that crude number of between 2 and 5% mortality by that level of underreporting, assuming that deaths are more likely to be detected. That gives us an estimate more like of the order of 1% of people infected with this virus might die, with an enormous amount of uncertainty, probably fourfold in each direction. So anywhere from about a quarter of a percent, which is comparable with um, uh, pandemic influenza viruses, the kind of 1968 and 1957 pandemics. Um, all the way up to 4%, which would be more comparable with um, the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic. Your estimates have a large range of uncertainty. How useful does that make them? No, I mean, I think it informs what in the UK is called what the reasonable worst case scenario. It, it informs planning, the kind of scale of planning countries should be prepared to undertake. If we have even a relatively small risk of, of a an epidemic with a, with a large public health impact in terms of hospital beds, occupied severe illness and death, then of course it merits a, a correspondingly large you know, preparedness effort. And these efforts you know, cost money, they divert resources, and so I mean, it informs those decisions. And I don't think the estimates at the moment are the level where we can be using them for predicting you know, this many of people will die and in the UK, for instance, or in any other country. But they do say this is a serious threat, which we need to plan for very seriously and dedicate resources to. And certainly that's what hap is happening in the UK and other countries. How many people might we expect to die in a country like the UK, for instance? Because just knowing what proportion of people being infected die doesn't tell you the overall impact on health and mortality unless you know how many people you might expect to be infected overall. Um, we don't have precise estimates of the attack rate at the moment, but we can go on the basis of past pandemics of respiratory disease, and, and really the best example there is influenza. And we know influenza pandemics, it varies, probably cause about somewhere between 25% and 40% of the population to become sick in the first year. Um, but some, a lot of those people have really quite mild disease. And then there's a hidden, what we never see is there's you know, something like another 20%, 30% of the population get infected but really are not showing any symptoms. So that gives a complete attack rate, you know, percentage of the population can be very, you know, uh, depending on the pandemic, then 60% might be a kind of central estimate for the first year of people who the proportion of the population get exposed to the virus and become immune, some of which develop symptoms. And that's the number then you multiply by the most broad definition of, of the case fatality ratio, the, the one where you're looking at what proportion of everybody who gets infected will die. I will now speak with Dr. Ilaria Dorigati, lecturer and Sir Henry Dale Fellow at Imperial College London. You and your team recently published a report on the severity of the current coronavirus outbreak. Can you explain to me what is the case fatality ratio? Yes, yeah, sure. The case fatality ratio, or the CFR, tells us about the probability of dying due to the infection. And this quantity really varies depending on the population that we look at. So, for instance, among the severely ill patients, we would expect a probability of death, a higher probability of death as compared to all infections which include people with no symptoms and typ who typically have a much milder infection. So at the end of an epidemic that is fully observed, we can calculate the uh, probability of death or the case fatality ratio, the CFR, simply by dividing the number of deaths by the number of cases. But at the beginning of an epidemic, in the early phases of an, epi of an epidemic, the CFR is actually quite challenging to estimate. There are two main challenges uh, when estimating the CFR early in an epidemic. The first challenge uh, derives from the fact that surveillance typically detects only the severe or mostly the severe cases at the beginning of a new epidemic. 
And so CFR estimates at the beginning of an epidemic tend to overestimate uh, the actual CFR that would be observed at the end of an epidemic when the case definition as well as surveillance is well established. The second challenge arises because we observe the onset of symptoms before, typically well before, than the clinical outcome of infection. So in other words, there is a time lag between the onset of symptoms and death or recovery. And so in this case, if we calculate the CFR by dividing the number of deaths observed at a certain point by the number of cases during a growing epidemic, we are, um, we are not accounting for the fact that we have not observed the outcome of the vast majority of the recent infections. The CFR estimates that we have obtained in this report uh, have been obtained by using statistical methods that combine data on the number of deaths and the number of recoveries and on the time lags between onset to death and onset to uh, recovery. Um, and the uncertainty that we have in the estimates really reflects the uncertainty that we have in the data at the current time. And so basically reflect the fact that we have been working with really small sample sizes uh, because of the current limited data that we have on this virus at the moment. How do the estimates from this report inform the outbreak response? Well, um, having um, estimates of severity, not just in terms of mortality, but also in terms of clinical progression of the disease are really important because um, they are useful not just for outbreak response, but also in terms of public health planning and preparedness, because they can inform and they can predict uh, what the healthcare demand and, for instance, what the hospitalization will be in other countries, for instance, in the UK or elsewhere, if an epidemic takes off in these other countries. I will now speak with Dr. Lucy O'Kell, lecturer and Royal Society Dorothy Hodgkin Research Fellow at Imperial College London. Can you explain what the limitations are in estimating case fatality ratios? Yes, yeah, so there's a number of uncertainties in the data we have at the current time. Uh, so an, a really important one is um, how long it takes between somebody first becoming sick and then going on to fully recover from the infection. The majority of cases that we're looking at at the moment, we don't know yet the final outcome of infection, so they're not recorded as having recovered or um, died at the moment. Another uncertainty is the um, amount of time for which the virus is detectable within the blood. And we also based our estimates on a single number for the prevalence of infection um, in early February. The data that you mentioned that goes into these uh, CFR estimates, where does that come from? So we have a team here who's been, who've been working continuously on searching for information on cases and updating those uh, daily. So we use data from as many sources as possible. Um, so first we have the number of cases and deaths reported um, from within China, within Hubei province. Uh, we also have some early case reports from the beginning of the epidemic in terms of time from onset of symptoms until death in early cases. We have data on people who contracted the uh, infection within Hubei province and then traveled abroad and were diagnosed there and have since been followed up in some detail. And we also have data on repatriation flights where all passengers were tested for infection. Uh, we don't expect the virus um, to have different case fatality ratios in different countries, but we might observe different numbers due to different levels of surveillance. Different countries are doing different amounts of testing and have different criteria for testing. And of course, quality of care in severe cases might affect the final case fatality ratio. Our understanding of the novel coronavirus epidemic remains limited in key areas. Scientists and clinicians at Imperial College London and around the world are working together to bring our best science to the forefront and find shared answers to shared problems. Mm -hmm.